to our Sunday. Am I? I think I am. I hear it in the. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to our Sunday morning live stream, September 13th, 2020. 15th Sunday after Pentecost, and we welcome you here, and thank you so much for joining us wherever you are, uh, across the, around the globe. Who knows, we might have some international people checking it out, who knows. Just a few announcements, all right, so I want to remind everybody um, about our book studies coming up, we got those maybe on slide here, uh, and the upcoming book studies, we have an anti-racist book study coming up in uh, we'll come back to that one. We'll come back to that slide, but let's talk about the book study. So we'll do uh, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. Uh, so get your orders in for that. Get it electronically. We're going to start that in October, like right on the start of October, and then we'll meet weekly to discuss the chapters. It should take about a month or so. And then uh, also for Advent, next slide there, we will have the book by Adam Hamilton, uh, Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. And you want to get your order into Terry Ency at the Clarkston UMC office by September 28th. Uh, it's $10, so um, make sure you get that to her as well. And if you get it to her by September 28th, it's only 10 bucks. After that, I think the price goes up, but she can get a group uh, order in. And there's some contact info for her to let her know if you want to get in on that book study, okay? Now we'll go back to the very <laughs> opening slide. There it is. So we got, of course, our Zoom prayer meetings, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There's the times. When I, <laughs> this last Friday, I, I didn't get on until 7.40 on accident because I started doing dishes after dinner and I, <laughs> I missed. But almost always right on time. Uh, the couple Announcements for some groups. The Lewis and First Care Team, you have a meeting September 21st, and the Lewis and SPR, you have a meeting September 16th. That one's via Zoom, so make sure you get that info from Liz. And then the Clarkston Church Council, you have a meeting September 26th via Zoom at 10 a.m. Now, skipping ahead a few slides, I want to draw your attention to a link to our bishop's blog, especially having to do with right now our response to the wildfire situations all over the Northwest. You're going to want to go read her letter. I sent it out in an email to some folks, but there's the address, and in that letter she talks about some things you can do right now. It has a couple links you can click on to uh, donate to the response team, to the Pacific Northwest Advance response team, and uh, we want to make sure you do that uh, if you can. Lots of stuff going on all over the Pacific Northwest, and so the lots to respond to uh, in this time, okay? Uh, we'll leave it up there for just a second so you can write it down. Maybe we'll also, maybe later I'll share it in a, a link or, or a, oh yeah, go ahead and make it small. There you go. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah, so write that down. Go find that, and in there she talks about ways you can give, okay? All right. Now let's move on to our gathering words. <coughs> And Rita's here over in the audience over here, and she's going to do scripture reading later, but you'll hear her voice maybe in my microphone. Uh, she's going to provide the all, so I have some good spacing. So open up your bulletins, or it'll be on the screen here in just a second, and you can follow along with our gathering words. Sing of God's mercy and grace. Praise God with laughter and joy. For God protects the lowly and avenges the misdeeds of the mighty. Sing of God's mercy and grace. Please join us for our opening song, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain.
All right, at this time, we will open up for sharing of joys and concerns. If you want to share some of those in the comment section, go ahead and put any joys or concerns. Uh, we write those down later and, uh, and share them in our prayer group. So um, go ahead and, and even if I don't mention them here, share them in that space there. Uh, a couple of things we want to be thankful for, of course, Rita and Patty and their safe return from Colorado. They made it through lots of weather, lots obviously smoke and things going on. So we're glad they're back home safe. Don Scheibe's nephew, Mark, uh, is he, he's basically in the final stages of his battle with uh, cancer. And so prayers for, for him uh, and as he transitions uh, and for the family, of course, um, as they walk alongside him on this journey. Elaine Baldridge, also known as Minnie, Minnie Baldridge, she was moved to Prestige Care. So prayers for her as she uh, adjusts to that. Um, some, sometimes that's a hard transition to make there. Beth Johnson also has recently been moved to Advanced Life Care, so same prayers for her. And then, of course, from Clarkston, you are aware of Ella Mae Wilson. She passed away, um, and the uh, funeral arrangements are being worked out right now, how we can do them, and we'll get you details on that, but please pray for her family, for Rod, uh, her son, and and uh, everyone else of in the community impacted by her. And of course, lots of prayers for all over the, I put Pacific Northwest, but it's all over <laughs> the West Coast, you know, uh, all around us and in lots of places. Uh, I mean, and we're getting, you know, we're getting, we're seeing the smoke here. So prayers even for here and our health, our lung health. And then uh, we want to really pray for the town of Malden that, that lost so much in those fires, 80% of their homes and, um, just so many people there and really all over the Northwest uh, having to go to temporary shelter and whew, just a strain and, and in the middle, of course, in the middle of a pandemic and virus and it's attacking the lungs. It seems like everything is just hitting our lungs uh, here. So prayers for everybody and for our lungs. Stay inside as much as you can while it's unsafe to breathe the air wear masks, all those good things, but please be in prayer for those people. So join me, continue to share your joys and concerns in the comments, but join me in prayer, and then we'll all join together for the Lord's Prayer. God, we come before you today, and we confess our, uh, our feelings of frustration, our uh, resentments, our bitterness, our sadness, nothing to really confess there, God, but other than to say we express that um, with the loss of loved ones, with people um, who are transitioning into late stages of cancer and also into care facilities. And right now we, we're so limited in our ability to visit uh, folks in those places. And Lord, we just we just pray. We pray for families who are walking through this right now in such a difficult time. Lord, we lift up to you, we really, we just lift up the entire West Coast and the Pacific Northwest and so many people being impacted in so many different ways by these fires that are raging. Uh, and we pray for the firefighters, we pray for the responders, we pray for their health as they rush into places and uh, rescue folks and do what they can to try to contain or put out and we pray for <coughs> families that have been displaced and people who have been displaced. Half a million in Oregon alone uh, finding new refuge right now, temporary shelter right now. have lost homes, many of them, uh, and don't know where they're going to go next. So we pray, Lord, um, <laughs> we just pray for the resources. We pray for the ability to make room for and to welcome in. And we pray for health of lungs, and we pray for towns that have lost everything, so many towns in Oregon, and then, of course, close to us, Malden. We just lift them up to you, Lord, and we, we cry out, God, uh, for mercy. And Lord, we pray for, um, we pray as we head this week, uh, actually, as the Pacific Northwest Annual Conference takes place this week in a weird and different way, three hours on Thursday night uh, to handle some business and vote on some things. And of course, we'll address 
our response to the, the pandemic and to the fires and things like that. Lord, I pray that uh, we would together combine our resources in a way to bring healing and wholeness and restoration. And God, we lift all this up to you now. We place this in your hands and we pray for the uh, uh, mentions and comments that um, I, I'm not able to read right now, but God, we lift those up to you and pray that you'd work in those situations too. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And together we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Rita is going to do our scripture reading today from Ezekiel. The scripture this morning is Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, and verses 25 through 32. What? It's on. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the world, the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent, as well as the life of the child, is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turns away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life because they considered and turned away from the transgressions that they had committed. They shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and return from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from all, for you've all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Hello, and welcome to Children's Moment. So there's something important that I want to tell you. Really, really important. So I need you to pay very close attention. Are you listening? You are a beloved child of God. God loves you. And he doesn't care if you make mistakes. He doesn't care if there are days when you just don't want to do anything. He still loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So that's the big secret for this week. Is, and it's, hopefully it's not a secret. Hopefully you've heard this before. But God's love is always there for us. God's grace which is a way he shows his love, is always reaching out to us, even when we have bad days or bad weeks or bad times. And right now, that might be what's going on. I mean, school just started and things have been changing, so it can be really hard to remember that God's always there. So I just wanted to give you guys a reminder. All right, let's go ahead and have a prayer. Dear Lord God, Thank you for this time together. Thank you for all of these lovely children 
Please help us as we watch over them with your grace and love. And help us as we go through these next weeks and remember your love through all of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Wonderful. If you ever want to join in on the virtual choir, let us know and we'll make sure you get to in on the emails of that. They always want some more voices. So uh, make sure you, if you want to be a part of that, let me know. All right, so we are, this is our last Sunday of our early fall series on learning to love our enemies. And we've talked about uh, some amazing topics of loving our enemies and, and what that looks like and creative w- approaches to that and balancing, not balancing, but talking about justice, but grace and mercy and all those things and forgiveness. Today is the final Sunday of that. And we're going to talk about, we're going to bring it really close to home, okay, on this Sunday. Now the other day, whenever a pastor, by the way, whenever a pastor says the other day, it could have been five years ago for all, for all you know. But anyway, the other day, I was with a friend, and this friend, we were having some lunch together, but this friend kind of wanted to talk a little more seriously about some stuff, and she was talking about some of the things in her life that were causing some frustration and things at work and different issues like that. And beneath the surface, now, uh, so this friend and I, we, we have some history together. We know each other well. We know the ups and the downs, the goods and the bads for both of us that we've been through some things, and I knew that underneath the surface of everything was something that she had been struggling with for quite a while, something that she took a lot of blame for, for herself, and she never talked about that, but as she was discussing all these other issues and things, I kept noticing she also said things like, she kept apologizing to me for things, you know, sorry for this, sorry for that, and I couldn't help but think underneath everything that she was telling me was this other issue, you know? You ever been in a situation like that or had friends like that where you know like they're talking about this stuff here, 
but you know that underneath is there's this thing that they're either not acknowledging, they're not talking about, it's just there. But you know that it's causing, not causing, but it's a kind of a root for a lot of these things that the person's talking about. I, that happens a lot with pastors. We know, you know, we have some insight into people's lives because they, sh- they share with us some things that maybe other people don't know about. And so we recognize that underneath a lot of surface issues are these things that are going on underneath and I was thinking about this with all these issues and her need to keep apologizing and say sorry to me for this or for that or to other people sorry 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 I kind of recognized what was going on that she was not she was wrestling with this thing of forgiveness for herself with this one issue and so I asked her, I said, I, w- uh, you, she was talking about these things, and I asked her to stop, and I said to my friend, you know, look, look me in the eyes here, and I want you to, to tell me what you see. You know, and she said, well, you know, you're a funny guy, whatever, all, all these things. And I said, now, you know, you and I have some history together. You know where I've, w- some of the things I've done that, you know, or, uh, the, that I've wrestled with or some self-doubt and all these different things. What do you see? Do you, when you look at me, do you see um, somebody that God forgives and that God can love? And she said, oh, of course, yeah. And I said, now look, now look really closely. Do you say you know everything, you know lots of stuff about me, you know where I've been, you know what I've done, you know all these things. Do you see somebody that God can love and forgive? And she said, yes, of course. And I said to my friend, I said, if you see that in me, knowing what you know about me, all the ups and the downs, why don't you see that for you? Why, and, and, and she was like, well, what are you talking about? I know God loves me and forgives me. And I said, then, so-and-so, why haven't you forgiven yourself for this thing? And it just hit her, you know, like, uh, yes, this is something, and it's hard, right? It is so hard sometimes to forgive ourselves. We get the idea that God has forgiven us and yet, for some reason, we hold on to this thing and refuse to forgive ourselves. Another story. I, a few years ago, I was having this recurring nightmare, okay? Um, and it was something was chasing me in this nightmare. It was not necessarily a monster, but it was a monster-like, you know? It was a, a, a terrifying figure that was chasing me. And it was chasing me in this in like a house that I, w- I had no clue what this house was through halls and through doors, and I could not find a way out. And this dream kept happening over and over. In this unfamiliar place, I could not find a way out. Well, I decided to do a little uh, digging onto like maybe what my mind might be processing with this dream, and I learned that there's a theory that that type of dream, I don't know if anyone's ever had that kind of dream, where like something is chasing you, and you can't get away from it, and, or you're stuck in a place that you can't get out of. And one of the theories is, and it made sense in my case, is that your uh, dreams are kind of projecting something about you internally that's going on, which is that you have ideas about yourself that you keep replaying over and over. These stories that you tell yourself that you can't seem to escape or something that maybe you can't forgive about yourself that you keep dwelling on, or perhaps some past suffering or pain that you keep reliving over and over, and you can't, it's like you can't get away from it. Just like in this nightmare, a monster that you can't seem to uh, ever seem to get away from, or a house or some unfamiliar place that you can never seem to get out of. And I thought, man, that's, that's true a lot of the times, isn't it? In our, that we kind of build up these ideas that we cannot escape from ourselves. And why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to forgive ourselves and to love ourselves? When Jesus talked about the greatest commandments, what did he say, right? Remember the greatest commandments? There's asked Jesus, you know, what are the greatest commandments? And he said, well, you kind of know them, you know, do these things. But he boiled it down to a couple things, right? If you can remember this in Matthew and in other places. He says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, mind, strength and love your neighbor as who? Yourself. Rita said it over here. As yourself. And you have to understand 
These three things, God, neighbor, self, are so connected that if you, we're told in Scripture that if you, if you can't love your neighbor, you can't really say you love God. And here Jesus is making even the connection to yourself too. You can't love your neighbor the way that you truly should and can if you're not also loving yourself. And you see that these three are connected, right? God, neighbor, self. And so if you're, you can't forgive or love yourself, what does it say about these other things and what's going on in those? Is it any wonder we struggle sometimes with letting things go with, uh, with our neighbors? Why we hold on to things? What ends up happening, right? We become, f- I don't know, there's like this fixation, at least in, in our culture, on punishment, right? We have to punish people for these things uh, that we see that are wrong. And we talked about it in our Sunday school a little bit, right? Punishment is like a very temporary quick fix. Does it really always address the problem? It might. I mean, if you, here's what I like to say as a parent, you know, I don't avoid necessarily punishment, but I make sure that there is involved in there correction and teaching and tenderness and love because the punishment is not going to fix the problem. It's not. It really isn't. It will continue to perpetuate the problem, actually. Um, it, what it can tend to do is it can drive children to just hide it better or to lie about it better or to whatever better because extrinsic motivation, external motivation, is nowhere near as uh, productive as intrinsic or internal motivation. And to to get to that, it's a long process that involves love and guidance and teaching and correction, yes, when, me- when needed. But if punishment is just this quick, let's, I just want to take care of it and get rid of it and move on, it's never going to work. It's going to lead to a lot of problems. It's going to lead to projection, right? This thing that's wrong with me that I want to fix, I see it in these people and I just, we've got to punch it. We've got to do something to get rid of it, right? Ezekiel 18 that Rita read, kind of has this argument against intergenerational and cycles of punishment, right? The proverb is, well, you know, we've got this punishment affects generations. In fact, there's somewhere in Scripture where it does talk a little bit about the consequences of sin playing out over generations. But God steps in here in Ezekiel 18 and says, I don't, why, why would I punish people for something they didn't do? Why would I continue this cycle of punishment? It doesn't work. It doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. Now, the consequences of sin, absolutely, they happen. Ezekiel 18 talks about that there, that these things that we do lead to death. As Zach in our Sunday school talked about, you know, it, it, it's na- the natural consequence of making bad choices and, and acting evilly play out. It happens. But punishment is not all that effective. It really is not. Um, a, a book that I kind of look to and kind of guides me in my parenting a little bit is uh, by Jane Nelson, I believe is, is the author, and it's called Positive Discipline. And in this book, it talks about the ways that, like, if you want to foster uh, cooperation and responsibility and um, self-discipline, right, in, in a child, uh, problem-solving skills, punishment is not, doesn't lead to that. When parents and teachers are controlling, it doesn't lead to self-responsibility, uh, self-discipline, creativity, and problem-solving skills. Neither does being too dismissive either. Somehow in there, you have to find a mix for your children of dignity, respect, lots of love, and yes, firmness and discipline. Discipline is not punishment though, by the way. There is a difference. Discipline means teaching, teaching and, and correction and those kind of things. Um, you need to foster an atmosphere of kindness, dignity, respect, and firmness. Now listen, it doesn't just automatically, that's for children, but I'm telling you, the switch doesn't get flipped when you become an adult. We need the same. We continue to need that in our lives. We are no different than children. We need um, kindness, dignity, respect, and firmness 
when it's, when it's necessary to help us develop responsibility, discipline, creativity, and all these things. We are the same, but for some reason we are consumed with punishment. And is it any wonder, like think about this, think about why, how do we get so consumed with punishment? I, I have a theory that a lot of times our um, image of God informs how we interact with our children or with, you know, when it comes to moments of needing discipline and correction. We think of God, we have this idea maybe a lot of times of God as this, God's going to, you can even hear people talk about, oh, if I walk into the church, I've had people say this to me, if I walk into the church, God's just going to strike me down. That is such an unhealthy view <laughs> of God, right? That the God has it out for you, that God wants to punish you. Ezekiel's telling us, look, I don't want to, I, I want people to live. I want people to grow and get better. <laughs> Smiting is not going to lead to growth and getting better, right? Um, but years of approaching discipline as punishment, I think leads to, a lot, I mean, look around us. Look at the way we lack in problem-solving skills, creativity, self-discipline, responsibility. We lack those things. It's almost as if the quick fix might have set us up for some bad problems, you know, uh, that we are dealing with today collectively. Lack of responsibility, cooperation, problem-solving skills. I think that stems, in my opinion, from our confusion of punishment with discipline. Ezekiel tells us one, you know, a couple things. One, we are not... Uh, punished for the sins of others. That's, that's not how that works. There are natural consequences that play out, and sometimes our, the consequences of mistakes we make hit other people. That's unfortunate, but it does happen. But it's not punishment for someone else's sins, okay? And the second thing is this. God desires positive growth and flourishing in our lives. I, I get that in Ezekiel 18. I get that in Scripture all over the place, okay? I think we need to let go of punishing ourselves. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for children. It's, uh, it doesn't work on us. There are natural consequences that we do have to deal with when we slip up and make mistakes. Uh, and we need to let those natural consequences do their work. But punishing yourself over and over and over it's counterproductive. It, it doesn't bring healing and it doesn't bring purpose, okay? Let the natural consequences work, but stop punishing yourself, okay? Ezekiel says this, and this is the part I really want to land on, that Ezekiel says God uh, uh, wants us to approach life with a new heart and a new spirit, to live by kindness, dignity, respect, and, and firmness. Then, forgiveness, love, and laughter can lead from that. We can heal. We can be open to new possibilities in ways that punishment does not leave us open to. Right? Punishment is like this vicious cycle that just keeps going. Like, I, I haven't... I haven't paid enough. I haven't paid enough. I haven't paid enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. This thing that I did disqualifies me. I've heard so many people tell me I can't be in ministry. I can't be a pastor because I did this thing. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can minister to people. You can bring life to people. You can bring health and healing to people. You have to start with yourself. You have to love yourself so that you can love your neighbor as yourself, right? You see the connection there? Um, I can remember sitting one time in college, my first year in college, way back when, in 1999. It could have been the spring of 2000, but it was in a psychology class, and the teacher talked about this Army veteran who every year, he, he was in his office, and, and the, the veteran was telling him his story, and he's like, I don't know what's going on with me, Every year, I just have this compulsion to go out and do some kind of like minor uh, uh, crime, you know, like shoplift, you know, take something from the store or whatever. And 
and I hope to get caught. And he usually did, and he would end up spending, you know, it's minor stuff, so he'd spend maybe, maybe it was drunkenness, public drunkenness or something like that, and he would spend a few days in jail or whatever, sometime, maybe sometimes longer, but it seemed like it happened every single year. And the, uh, the teacher, who was a, a practicing counselor, was working with him, and he, he realized the date, it was almost to the date every year that he would do something and then get caught, they unpacked this and they realized this army veteran on that date back in whatever year in Vietnam, he was serving with some people and his buddies, they, uh, I, I don't know all the ins and outs, but his, his buddies ended up dying in, in Vietnam. He did not. And he felt guilt for not dying or because I don't know if he felt like it was his fault in some way or whatever it was, but he blamed himself or he felt guilty for it, and it was, almost, it was on the date of the, the death, right around it, that he would do this every year. He, w- he needed to be punished, is what he felt like. I need to pay a price for this thing that happened. And the counselor basically helped him, like, okay, think about it. What if you thought about it this way? Your buddy's died but what if it think about this in a big story way rather than focus on that moment and like what you could have done or or why it wasn't you what if you focused on a bigger story of now how are you going to live to honor those uh those buddies of yours that passed away if they laid down their life for you if that was the story i can't remember exactly but if they did why punish yourself for it why not live in a story of love and grace and healing because that's probably what they would want you to do, right? And so he was able to work through that, but I, it just clicked for me in that moment. Like, that's, we do that. We punish ourselves over and over and over, and we get so zoomed in on this one event, this one moment, and we forget there's a bigger story going on, and we get stuck in this one moment over and over and punishing ourselves over and over for it. And we forget that there's a bigger story of God's grace and forgiveness going on and God wants you to be a part of it and to move into that story. Um, You know what helps me really understand it a little bit? Actually is Harry Potter, okay? And here's here's what I mean. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, there's these things called boggarts, all right? There are these um, shape-shifting creatures and they appear uh, to the person as the thing they fear the most okay scary right and the professor lupin teaches the students the way to deal with them is to you use this spell to transform them into something else that's ridiculous and funny and all you can do is laugh at it and you're not frozen in fear by it anymore isn't that just the truth though like, what if you looked at that moment that you, is holding you back or that you fear the most or that you're punishing yourself over and over? What if you transformed that moment into that was a place, yes, something bad, I made a mistake, but I can, I, it's a part of my bigger story of growth and, and positive change. I can learn from that and I can move forward in love and grace and bring that to other people. Right? I mean, isn't that just the truth? Or I like, I think of it, um, The Sixth Sense, the movie The Sixth Sense. This is another good way to explain it. The kid Cole, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but the kid Cole, if you haven't seen it, he can see, you know, the famous line, I see dead people. And he is afraid, he's terrified by these ghosts that he sees until he learns these are ghosts who need help. And so he has this gift now to help them, and he's no longer terrified. You see what I'm saying? What if we creatively transform these moments and do something for our growth and positive movement that maybe God is using, can use, so that we move into a bigger story of grace and healing and forgiveness? I, I think that's exactly what God wants. And is and and exactly what we can do. So this is the good news. God does not want to punish you. 
Ezekiel tells us God wants you to have a new heart and a new life, a new spirit for life. So that, yes, you're going to make mistakes, but in this new heart and with this new spirit, can you accept forgiveness? Can you accept that God wants to transform that moment into something bigger and better? Let the consequences do their work. There's going to be consequences. Let them do their work to produce a life of laughter and love and grace and respect and kindness and dignity so that you can creatively respond to new challenges. I think that's just the better way. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I thank you for opportunities where we can be confronted with the darkness within and the enemy within. But God, I would pray, my prayer is that we not get stuck and frozen in that moment and not see an enemy, but instead see an opportunity to grow, to have a new heart and a new spirit for life, to move forward and break a cycle of punishment and instead step into a bigger story of grace and forgiveness and healing so that we can provide it for others too so that we can connect with others and help them learn you are loved. You are forgiven. God wants growth for you and a new heart and a new life, a new spirit uh, for life. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear things in a different way to transform those moments into moments of life and laughter. We love you, Lord God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to zoom quickly through. I lost my notes. I don't know where I put them. But we're going to zoom quickly through the offering time. All right. Uh, it's going to be on the screen there. You know this. You know all this. Ways to give while we're away. You can mail in uh, checks. Uh, the addresses are up there on the screen. You can also look them up in phone book. If you have a phone book. I don't even know if people have phone books anymore, to be honest with you. Look it up on, your, uh, on our website. Look it up on your phone. You'll find those addresses. Mail those in. S or you can drop them off at the office. If you have, uh, you know, if uh, somebody's in the office, swing on by, drop them off. Call first. Online giving. This is one of the easiest and quickest ways. You can go to our websites on the Clarkston page. It's that green button up there at the top. Click that. Set up your giving. On the Lewiston page, over on the right-hand side, there's a contact us, drop that down button, and then you'll see a, uh, uh, it's a donate uh, button there. Set up your giving there. Or you can do it through a mobile app. Download for Clarkston, you want to download the Tithely app. T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y, Tithely. Search for Clarkston UMC after you download it. Set up your giving that way. Or for Lewiston, look for the uh, Give Plus mobile app. Download that, search for Lewiston First UMC and set up your giving that way. Okay? I'm going to say a prayer for our offering. And then we're going to do a closing song and benediction. But I have a little, little something for you before benediction too. So, all right, uh, please pray with me for the offering. God, we thank you for this offering that we will have today. We pray your blessings upon uh, any of the funds that are sent in or given through a mobile app or online or mailed in. God, we pray your blessings on these funds that we would Use these to help others step into a bigger story of healing and grace and forgiveness uh, and to escape that cycle of punishment. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, our closing song, God, How Can We Forgive?
thank you again so much for joining us today for our worship service. I want to remind you, we do have, in just a few minutes, I'll hop on to our uh, Zoom call. The link is uh, Kyle has shared or attached to our video there. You can find it. I'll put it in comments, too. Uh, you can just hop on. We can just chit-chat. You can ask me any questions about uh, the sermon today or anything like that. Also, yesterday, we had a couple of birthdays. We had Patty Mills. Her birthday was yesterday. So happy uh, belated birthday to her. I, I actually called her and said happy birthday. But Isaac Bill also had a birthday yesterday. Happy belated birthday to him. After our benediction and as part of our kind of like postlude time, uh, Isaac, we're going to play a, a video that Isaac uh, sent us. Um, I Saw the Light, uh, his version of, uh, his cover of I Saw the Light. Really good. So we'll play that before we go into postlude. But join me for a benediction. Let me send you off with a benediction. As you go forth from this place or from wherever you are, plunge into the waters of life unafraid, for God goes with us. Move forward in life with purpose and passion, for Christ is our guide and guardian. Live as people of powerful hope, for the Spirit renews us each and every day. Go with God's blessings. Peace be with you. Uh-oh. Oh, is it really? What happened? Just like blind men, I wandered alone.